This is Paul Ekberg from the Division of Infectious Diseases at Stanford University. In this video, we will discuss two antibacterial classes of protein synthesis inhibitors, the tetracyclines and the aminoglycosides. The other protein synthesis inhibitors are discussed in part two of the video. The learning objectives for this video include describe how the various protein synthesis inhibitors differ with regard to the mechanism of action and resistance, List the key adverse effects of the tetracycline class. Recognize that aminoglycoside use is limited by the adverse effects and need for serum level monitoring. And explain the ribosomal protection resistance mechanism unique to this particular class of antibiotics. This overview will focus on the protein synthesis inhibitors depicted here by the antibiotics that target the 30S or 50S ribosomal subunits. You will see that this group of antibacterial compounds is very diverse, containing a number of different antibiotic classes. We will focus on the commonly used systemic antibiotics used in routine clinical care. In this part one video of protein synthesis inhibitors, we will cover the tetracycline class, seen here targeting the 30S ribosomal subunit in the yellow highlighted box, and the aminoglycoside class, which is not pictured here. Please watch the part two video to learn more about the classes that target the 50S subunit. In order to understand the mechanisms of action of the various bacterial protein synthesis inhibitors, you must remember the basics of protein synthesis, namely translation, where mRNA is decoded by the ribosomal complex to synthesize a polypeptide, the details of which are beyond the scope of this video. In very general terms, the protein synthesis inhibitors act at the level of the bacterial 50S or 30S ribosomal subunit. In doing so, they are bacteriostatic rather than bactericidal agents. One easy way to digest the various mechanisms of action is to remember that the tetracycline class binds to the 30S subunit to block protein synthesis, shown here in the green box, whereas most other protein synthesis inhibitors act at the 50S subunit, shown in the yellow box. The aminoglycosides are unique in that they have the ability to block formation of the 50S plus 30S initiation complex, and they block final translocation of the polypeptide chain, among other less well understood actions. See the blue boxes at the start and end of the polypeptide elongation cycle on the slide. We will cover, again, the tetracyclines and the aminoglycosides in this part one video. The tetracyclines are broad-spectrum agents that are most commonly used for mild to moderate community-acquired infections, such as community-acquired pneumonia, and they are well suited to treat such infections given their activity versus common gram-positive pathogens, gram-negative pathogens, and atypical pathogens. Two commonly used tetracyclines are listed here in the blue box. Common clinical uses are seen in the second bullet. They are usually the drugs of choice for some rickettsial infections, including Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and I've already mentioned community-acquired pneumonia. Plus, you will read that the tetracyclines may be part of treatment regimens for a variety of relatively uncommon infections, such as plague, tularemia, brucellosis, and Lyme disease, to name a few. I encourage you to read about these infections in more detail, as they are beyond the scope of this brief overview. More recently, the use of oral tetracyclines, such as doxycycline, has seen a resurgence in the outpatient management of methicillin-resistant staph aureus, or MRSA, infections, given the relative lack of effective oral options for that particular type of infection. The tetracyclines are associated with a number of important adverse events. Gastrointestinal toxicity is the most common, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and other types of GI intolerance. Alteration of the intestinal and vaginal microbiota can occur, leading to overgrowth of certain pathogenic bacteria as well as fungal pathogens, as is the case with Clostridium difficile associated disease, such as colitis, and vaginal candidiasis. It's imperative to remember that tetracyclines are contraindicated in pregnancy and in children up to the age of eight. Tetracyclines can permanently stain the enamel of teeth, as seen here in the picture, and deposit in growing bone, causing a number of bony defects in children. Hepatotoxicity is rare, and oftentimes tetracyclines can lead to asymptomatic elevations of liver transaminase levels in the blood, 
But you might see liver failure very rarely, especially in the context of pregnancy. Pseudotumor cerebri, or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, may feature non-obstructive intracranial pressure elevations, headaches, and visual changes, including potential vision loss in severe cases. The mechanism of this interesting adverse event is unknown. Tetracyclines can also cause a lupus-like reaction or exacerbate signs and symptoms associated with underlying systemic lupus erythematosus, and therefore this class of agents should be avoided in patients with underlying lupus. And finally, acute drug-induced pancreatitis is rare. Very briefly, the glycocyclines are mentioned here for completion, but they are rarely used in everyday clinical practice. I consider them a subclass of the tetracyclines. Only one member of this class is available, tigacycline, which is structurally a close cousin of minocycline, an older tetracycline. It is very broad spectrum, as you can see in the first bullet. Regarding clinical uses, it is FDA approved for skin and soft tissue infections, intra-abdominal infections, and pneumonia. However, it's rarely used clinically. For example, the treatment of infection caused by carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae, or CRE. Recall this emerging drug-resistant pathogen was discussed in the beta-lactam video. In contrast to the tetracyclines, the aminoglycosides are narrow-spectrum agents, primarily active versus gram-negative bacilli. Commonly used representatives are seen in the blue box. Common clinical uses include double coverage or use in combinations that require additional gram-negative coverage, especially for severe Pseudomonas aeruginosa infections. These include things like intra-abdominal infections, urinary tract infections, and enterococcal endocarditis. Inhaled tobramycin might be used for pulmonary exacerbations in cystic fibrosis, a very rare disease. And finally, streptomycin and amikacin are options for multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, often in combinations with three, four, five, or even more antibiotic options. Although the immunoglycosides have multiple potential clinical uses, their adverse effect profile has limited their widespread use, and they are not considered frontline therapy for these infections, which leads us to the next slide. In general, aminoglycoside-related adverse events are more common in elderly patients when using higher doses or if used for prolonged durations. Ototoxicity is particularly important because this particular effect might be irreversible, namely auditory or vestibular changes, including tinnitus, hearing loss, or vertigo. You can see in the picture on the right that this rat organ of corti was affected with progressive loss of hair cells after exposure to aminoglycoside therapy, and a similar effect may occur in humans. Nephrotoxicity is another important adverse event. Patients who are at higher risk for this particular finding include those who receive other nephrotoxic agents or diuretics, among other medications. This event is signaled by rising creatinine levels in the blood or increasing serum levels of the drug similar to that seen with vancomycin, so we must monitor serum levels. Please refer to the glycopeptide talk to learn more about vancomycin. Fortunately, nephrotoxicity is usually mild and reversible, but again, it could lead to irreversible loss of renal function if left unchecked. Finally, neuromuscular blockade is very rare, and it is reversible with the medications you see listed here in the bullet. Finally, this slide shows the three major bacterial resistance mechanisms against the protein synthesis inhibitors. Namely, number one, impaired concentrations within the bacterial cell, whether by impaired influx or increased efflux out of the cell. Number two, ribosomal protection. Or number three, enzymatic inactivation via degradation or alteration of the antibiotic. With regard to the tetracyclines, the first two mechanisms are the most important. For example, bacteria may produce efflux pumps, which pump tetracyclines out of the bacterial cell. In the case of tetracyclines, ribosomal protection is exemplified here by the TET-M ribosomal protection protein, 
This unique protein weakens the tetracycline attachment to its 30S target, thus freeing the ribosome of the tetracycline inhibition and allowing protein synthesis to continue. With regard to the aminoglycosides, the first and third mechanisms of resistance appear to be the most clinically relevant, namely impaired transport of the aminoglycosides into the bacterial cell or enzymatic degradation of the antibiotic in the cell by a number of different enzymes, the details of which are beyond the scope of this overview.